Okay. Everyone, please be prepared for the next, for the second part of today's lectures. I have a quick announcement to make. Please be aware of the time change tomorrow. Think of that. This is important. Um, also, besides your um, shorts you need to bring tomorrow, please also think of white coats because we're going to the um, wards at the university hospital. Don't forget your white coats. If, if you have two, bring two. We need every coat we can have. And also, tonight's our social evening at 7.30 and the, at the office pub in Trautensdorf Gasse 3, I think. Um, you're all very welcome to be there and to, I hope we can have a good time there. Well then, I will ask Dr. Prozen to continue his speech. Thank, Thank you, very, you much. very much. Okay. Um, how was this lecture? Was it too academic? Or did you take it? Makes sense? Okay. I just want you to now be with me for the cases that I have prepared for you and we'll just run through the logic behind it, okay? And how to incorporate the ultrasound. Okay, so question for you. 77-year-old grandpa visits ED because of back pain. The back pain is for three hours. It was of sudden onset. No radiation, no other symptoms. He had some back problems before. Let's say he has history of hypertension, congestive heart failure, hypertension, congestive heart failure. His vital signs, he's a little bit hypotensive, relative hypotensive. First question, first question. Uh, what is your differential diagnosis in this case? What could be possible causes? Ruptured aortic aneurysm? Spinal stenosis? Yeah? Maybe. But it's not exactly life-threatening. Agree? Okay? Kidney stones? Elos? No, I'm asking you. Not exactly. So stop me if I'm talking too much crap. Pyelonephritis. Okay, out of this that we mentioned, what would be most life-threatening? Something that we have to exclude. Ruptured aortic aneurysms. You agree with that? So focus will be somewhere very high up there. Okay. So what other tests you would do, and in what order? So, focus, anything else? Blood count, lipase, MRI. If one test, which would be the first test? Focus, which application that I mentioned so far? Aorta measurement, you agree with that? Okay, let's put the probe on. And we see this. What do we see? We see vertebral body here, but on it, quite superficial, look, 6.8 centimeters, huge pulsating mass. It ruptured here in the posterior part. Actually, this patient already was operated. And the fibrosis after operation on his vertebra saved him because when it ruptured, it was contained. Okay? And he didn't die. Okay, could let's run through and then we'll do the application as such as well. Okay? Good. So that was first case. Please remember ruptured aortic aneurysm or aortic aneurysm that ruptured is disease of elderly, okay? It's quite unlikely that I will scan you guys because you shouldn't have this disease, okay? And with the elderly, if they present with back pain, abdominal pain, 
renal colic, classical pitfall, or shock, or syncope, scan their aorta. It takes three seconds, it saves lives. Okay? Otherwise, you cannot know it. All these classical propedeutic signs of palpating, uh, palpating pulsatile mass in uh, average Styrian 77-year-old men, I believe it's quite difficult to palpate anything except their beer bauch. Yeah? Okay. 77-year-old female, a male, his peer from the university, visits his GP. He also has history of hypertension, heart failure, inhale, takes all these medications. His vital signs are normal. And there is one student, let's say, Leonard from Sono Graz. And he asks, oh, can I play around with Pocus because we have this machine, doctor. And Leonard does the scan and he finds this. Now what? Now what? The patient walked in without any symptoms. He came for some receptum, yeah? for perindopril, or fin, whatever. He walked in, hello doctor, I need some receptum bitte. Uh, we did not even measure vital signs, nothing. Okay, please sit down, and Leonard comes in, and he says, oh, can I please, we are doing study in Graz, can I please scan you? He lies down, and you get this. Now what to do? Operate. Rettungswagen straight to the operation theater. Consult vascular surgery. Consult psychiatry. Red blood cells. Ringer. Okay. You will learn about this in your medical school, but I would, what I would like to point out, if you take this same gentleman, two weeks before his first case, and you find this, you did what would be called screening exam for the presence of aortic aneurysm. Did this aneurysm, when he came in for perindopril, was it a rupture? Why not? Because he didn't have signs and symptoms of rupture. This patient had this aneurysm growing for past seven years, okay? He's okay with it, but it is a bomb that can tick off anytime. So this patient will very likely need elective operation. It's great that Leonard found him, but this is not rupture, okay? You guys are very like, lucky to have this gentleman with us from Oz, because he truly posted, I would say, tweet of the decade. This tweet is so profound that in my heart, you won like a Twitter Nobel Prize. You, dude, did more for medicine than many of the conferences. For one simple reason, because I was never taught this. I was completely oblivious. Why medicine is art and it doesn't work from Google or whatever. As I saw yesterday, Aidan explained, what was the pretest probability of this second gentleman's rupture of AAA? Did he have any signs and symptoms? He walked in. What was his pretest probability? Zero. Almost zero, right? No signs and symptoms. Now the thing is, even if you take the best test with the best likelihood ratio, and you have learned that, right? Sensitivity, specificity, minus something. I don't know. I don't care. But what I care is that the likelihood ratios of 10 and above are very good, or 0 0.1 decimal or below are 
are also very good in excluding. But now the trick is, even if you have the best text with likelihood ratios of 50, which are very rare, mostly there are five, three and a half, something. But even if you have something, some test, like I believe Aorta probably is, like 50 something, if you don't have pre-test probability, look, the magic is that the lines go through the pre-likelihood ratio down. If you don't have possibility of the disease, then even with the best test, it's highly unlikely that you confirm the disease, and that is post-test probability. You see what I mean? First, if you're looking for the rupture, you must have signs and symptoms of rupture. That's why I never understood when an old professor in propedeutics in third year, he said, the basis of medicine two-thirds is history. Then 10, 15% physical exam, and then all this laboratory. And I thought, yeah, 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 that was like 2000, brave new world, yeah, yeah, now internet will save everything, bullshit. I would say now he underestimated with all the inflation, the flooding of informational technologies, it's even more important that you know what you're looking for. Okay, so history will be even more important. But now, please remember one thing. These likelihood ratios that measure how good or telling the test is in confirming or excluding the pathology. This also applies to questions, historical questions. Let's say, in chest pain, someone comes in with a chest pain. Okay, uh, why did you come today? I have a pain in my chest. The next question, where is your pain radiating to, is also a test. But I will tell you like this. The likelihood ratio for radiation towards left shoulder, likelihood ratio for confirming ACS is only two point something. Likelihood ratio going radiating towards right shoulder, I think it's four point something. And the likelihood ratio of radiation towards both shoulders is six or seven. So what I want you to take out, this classical question, where does this go to? Left shoulder, this is BS. The key question, strategic question, does it go into both shoulders? And if you have fairly small likelihood ratio, a small pretest probability, like somewhere here, if the likelihood ratio is seven, zzz, across, oops, this patient, even if with negative EKG, is going to hospital. Okay? You stand what I mean? So the whole art of medicine is how to put these tests. Where does it go? How is it? What is the what is the character of it? What are your risk factors? You put them together, and after eight strategic questions, EKG, troponin, you get post-test probability. Okay? So the pre-test probability of rupture with this patient was basically zero because his history was zero. Okay? But with the first patient, he started with possible, possible rupture, very good test, and of course his post-test probability takes him straight to the operating theater. You see what I mean? So my only st story today here, my summary is not about POCUS. POCUS you will learn. You have to learn now in medical school the art of good history that ask sensible telling, telling questions, okay? This I didn't know, I wish I could go back 20 years and learn that. I would be much better and much smarter doctor. So please, especially with ultrasound. Ultrasound is like a sniper, okay? Very precise. 
very good, but you have to know what you're looking for. Otherwise, you will shoot people left and right, and you will make mistakes. Okay? When we started, especially when we started with residents and students, there was so much opposition. Wow, you're learning in this. They can't even do EKG. They can't do propedeutics. And we thought, oh, maybe it's true. Maybe we are teaching wrong faith. Maybe this is hypocrisy. We shouldn't teach you. But after 10 years now, I dare to say, focus is like a litmus test, is a marker. Whoever knows medicine will make good use of focus. Who doesn't know medicine will fuck up. And with ultrasound will F A even more. Okay? So medical basis first. Pathophysiology, propedeutics first. Okay, case number four. 35 year old female, after syncope, she felt sort of weak, collapsed, no other symptoms, except when she lay down in Rettungswagen, she felt pain in her right shoulder. So, young female of bearing age, what would be your uh, differential diagnosis? So, mildly, uh, so um, borderline hypotension. What would be your differential diagnosis? Pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism. Heart? Heart stroke. Heart stroke. Okay. ACS? A little bit too young, but okay. Ectopic pregnancy? Ectopic pregnancy. General hypertension? General hypertension? Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. But it wasn't that? Okay. What is the worst of this diagnosis? Worst first. This is my dogma. Worst first. I don't care about uh, psoriasis, I really don't. But I care about ectopic, ACS, I care. Okay. Uh, based on ectopic, I can't really look into it, but I can look for the consequence of the bleed, right? Intraperitoneal, we would do fast exam. And we actually did find fluid in Morrison's pouch, you see how much? Very little. Only when she breathed. Only when she breathed, there was some fluid. Okay? So positive fast. So much that from the pelvis, it already flew into the, spilled into the Morrison's. And this is probably also, she had no vaginal bleeding, no much abdominal pain, but she had something from propedeutics, the care sign, where the bloody irritation of diaphragm radiates into right shoulder. Okay, so the key here was, why would 35-year-old healthy female have blood or any fluid in her Morrison? Why? She's not ascetic, ascetus, and her beta through clear blue was positive. So that was ectopic, okay? And of course, I did not operate. But in the system that is very similar to yours, where you have to call up a resident and a specialist and so forth, to be able to advocate for the patient. Listen, guys, we are meeting at your gynecho clinic, and we are coming straight before your OR. Meet me there in 13 minutes. Thank you. Goodbye. Doo, 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 doo. They can't resist. Okay? This is the beauty of it. And of course, there was also some intra-abdominal bleed. There was also some residual reaction in the uterus and so forth. But I'm not a gynecologist. I don't really know. I don't care. But we saved this patient because we didn't say just, oh, she collapsed like all these ladies collapse. Okay. Bonus slide. Differential diagnosis of syncope is actually very much similar to differential diagnosis of shock. Because syncope, which is transient loss of consciousness and the postural tone, is actually short-lived little shocky. Okay? Pathophysiologically, it's a circulatory problem. So same things, and the mnemonic here would be head, 
heart vessels, mostly the heart. Okay, heart attack, embolism, aorta, and rhythm, rhythm disturbances. And E stands for ectopic. Okay. Another granny brought in by ambulance by us due to collapse, tahypneic, cold, sweaty, pale. I think it's obvious she's shocked in clinical shock, not cultural shock, clinical shock. And she has borderline hypotension due to her history of hypertension that's probably too low for her. Okay? So clinically, she's shocked. Differential is broad. And what we would do here, please pay attention to her vital signs. So she is 80 over 60. Saturation is okay, but her pulse. So heart rate is 180. What would you do? Which focus applications you would put on her? Aorta? IVC. IVC? OK. Then you come with a probe. You put it on, and I would slap you. Why? Yeah, but first you would put on EKG. Okay, her pressure, his, her rate is 180. Okay, so I want to emphasize, focus comes as a part of the package. It might be a very big package for me because I don't know much else, but there are other things. And for tahi arrhythmias, this was her problem. Ventricular tachycardia. Sure, you can see very hard, fast beating heart, but we need echocardiographic, uh, echocardiographic diagnosis. Okay, and with shock, you will learn that in ALS, in uh, internal medicine, she needs some ketamine and 200 joules of electricity. Yeah, and please don't come with a gel. Okay. So please remember, focus is part of the A, B, C, D, or secondary exam. An A, B, C, D, E exam means all the vitals, saturation, EKG, IV line, sugar, and focus. And rush if patient is shocked. 70-year-old male, again, dyspnea, three hours, chest pain, Arterial hypertension, congestive heart failure, osteoarthritis. He's severely tachydyspnoic, low saturation, bit tachycardic, <coughs> hypotensive. What would be your differential diagnosis? So he is shocked and also has a respiratory failure. So he has B failure and C failure. What could connect the two? PAE? Yeah, pulmonary embolism. Excellent. Anything else? Pneumonia? Could be, especially febrile. Anything else? Cholecystitis? Pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema. Excellent. Okay, what would you do? What would you do? Hopefully, you would do EKG. You agree? Has some chest pain. Apply yeah? Apply oxygen. What do you recognize in these leads? Uh, these ST and Ts are quite high, and the ST depressions. So maybe that would be STEMI. Yeah? Okay, and he's shocked because of lack of ionotropy, pump failure. And his shock is manifesting in pulmonary congestion. So diffuse, bilateral, B lines, pulmonary edema. Okay, what else can we see? We would most probably see dilated IVC because of the backlog of all this fluid. It cannot go forward, so it gets stuck backward. And probably with such Bad urinotherapy, we would actually see less of the squeeze of the heart. Okay? So ejection fraction would be lower. Good, bad, or ugly, 
That was the one that we said, at least bad, if not ugly. Okay? So what is the treatment for this patient, ultimately? What does he need? A, some more ultrasound gel. B, prayer. C, aspirin and go home. And D, PCI, coronary intervention. Hopefully, right? Of course. So, another poster child, pulmonary edema, heart failure. Another woman of mid-age, collapse, dyspnea, no previous diagnosis or treatments. She had a flu last week, so she was pretty much at the rest. She has also some central chest pain. Uh, as you see, she's tachydysnoic, little bit hypoxic, tachycardic, and hypotonic. What would be your differential? Pneumonia, okay. Anything else? Aortic aneurysm? I mean, she might have an aneurysm. Did, did it rupture? I don't think so. So even if we find it, I don't know what to do with it. Okay? No history of rupture. Anything else? What is more likely? Pulmonary embolism. Heart failure. Pneumonia. I agree with that. So we would do EKG as part of the initial assessment. Sinus tachycardia. Incomplete, incomplete right bundle branch block. Mm, axis one, AVF positive, so that's normal, but we see some diffuse uh, T wave inversion, antero and, lat uh, and inferior, which is quite specific for PE, and then we will put the probe on, and we would see A lines, A profiles on her lungs, but she's hypoxic, but her lungs sound and look okay. Okay, so we have to look differently. It's not her lungs. We could do IVC, Santa Cava, which probably would be enlarged. And this is equivalent of jugular venous distension. And we would see the right into the pulmonary artery with a pulmonary hypertension, right ventricular, right ventricular strain, big IVC. And if we are very pedant, and there were Austrian studies on that, uh, I don't remember this doctor's name, but he can even find pulmonary infarcts. But we don't need here, right? Because the history and hemodynamics, it's clear enough. We have a story and we have a nidus. We have a cause. Okay. Another multifocal, multi-system approach DVT, IVC, heart, pulmonary exam. All put together, this sounds PE. But if you take only one of them, you don't have the diagnosis. Okay? This is the beauty of it. Severely dyspneic, very distressed lady, hypoxic, hypoxic. The artifacts in EKG were just too big. He was so distressed. He was, so, uh, he was so distressed. Even we couldn't measure BP. We tried to listen to breath sounds. Maybe it was a little bit less heard on the left. What would your, your differential diagnosis? So dyspnea, severe distress, and lung, lung phenomena less on the left side. Pneumothorax. Okay. What would you do next? Especially maybe with this vital signs and this appearance. What would you do next? Is this simple pneumothorax? Medium or large? Maybe even tension? Okay. I tried ultrasound, but it was all shaky. Everything was sliding and nothing was sliding because he was so Tahipneic. Impossible. Okay? So back to the good old days. Take a needle. 
he thanked me in five seconds. It works that fast. Okay? So please don't forget, ultrasound is great. I'm the first to retweet Aiden. But it's in the context. You have to know when you can and you should use it. Okay? So nothing from ultrasound. Yeah? You come with your doctor skills. And one of the skill, very useful skill, will be focus. Don't forget that. Okay, so before we go, Santa Cava, quite useful. If very collapsed, try your fluids very liberally. Symptoms of rupture of aorta, of course you check for aorta. Otherwise you can do screening exam, but then we have to screen whole population. So maybe with the Sono army, one day we can, but today not yet. Intraperitoneal fluid, uh, hemorrhage of whatever cause, check. Okay? And if they are the volume depleted, bleeding, they should also have collapsed IVC. You agree with that? So you see the consequence as well. In sepsis, you can look for causes, pneumonia, polycystitis, abscess, and then you also usually see hemodynamic consequence of this distributive shock. The cava will be collapsed. Liberally, you start with fluids. If fluids don't raise the pressure, you add vasopressors. Massive PE is a poster child of POCUS. Otherwise, all these people either go to CTA, if they are well enough, or, uh, or someone has to find some better ways. Cardiogenic shock, especially with systolic dysfunction, lungs, IVC, and function of the heart. If you're suspicious of shock, you check for tamponade. There is no freaking way otherwise. Classics back triad, hypotension, muffle sounds, and JVD is only sensitive 50%. So 50-50, you toss the coin. As useful as that. And don't forget in dyspnea and shock, tension pneumothorax maybe, massive PE. Okay, let's try something on stage. And now we can show you how we do the aortic exam and how we do the cardiac focus exam, okay? Do we have a volunteer from the beach? Yes, please, come. Yeah, sure. Everything. Come. No, we go here. Okay. So maybe first we'll do the aortic exam. Please lay it down. Uh, all this is screened and everything. So you all see? Oh, can you all see? Okay. So, aha, the screen is onwards. So which probe will we take for abdominal aorta? Which probe? Cardiac, linear, abdominal? Abdominal? Abdominal. Marker towards which side? Marker on the probe, which side? By convention, always to the right or always to the head? Which plane will we take for aorta? We will cut the patient across like a sausage. Okay, so eine Klobase, we take a knife and we cut him like this. Zuck. Okay, so mid abdominal, just above umbilicus, transverse Klobase Schnitt. Okay, so for that, we take transverse view, marker, marker towards right. And you see here, if the marker is towards right and the marker on the screen is on the left side of the screen, this is right and this is left side. Okay? Now I put the probe just above umbilicus, just above his belly button. Unfreeze it. Do some less depth. Oops. 
groups like this. Okay. So tell me where are we now? Just above umbilicus. Where is right? Where is left? His patient's right. Patient's right is on here, and the patient's left is here. I am just on the convexity, convexity of the vertebral body. Can you see that vertebral body? The white line, and on the convexity, I can see some circle pulsating. Can you see the pulsating circle that is lying on the vertebral body? What could that be? Aorta. So the simple logic here. Uh -huh. Oh, does it work? Uh, not sure. No. Doesn't work. Doesn't matter. So the simple logic is we cross sectioned him. Yeah. And then we will take the measurement. Uh, sorry. Uh -huh. There's some lag. Uh -huh. I see. No? Uh, so, uh, please help me. I don't know why it doesn't want to measure, but. Aha, uh -huh, like this. So, we would take, as I said, from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Cross section, and this is diameter of aorta. So, measure, oops, a marker here, boom, no. Marker here, yeah, no. No, we don't want that. Hmm. Yeah. I think no. Yeah. Okay, so from, uh, from here, 12 o'clock. No. no. Okay, you get the point, right? Yeah. From 12 to, to 6 o'clock, probably 1.6 centimeters, which is about right. Okay? Now, the thing is that aneurysms can be vesicular or saccular. Vesicular is long and saccular is like outpouching. And in the infra infrarenal session, section, you can have, if you only measure in one place, you can miss the saccular aneurysm. So we want you to measure, and you will try that, to measure in three slices. One, three centimeters up, slice, three centimeters up, slice. And if all three are the same measurement, then most probably there is no aneurysm. Okay? Now the beauty starts if just above the belly button I have the aorta and watch the magic. If I go caudal, one becomes two. Why? Because they bifurcate. And it is pretty much always around the belly button. Okay? You don't have to measure the iliac arteries, but just check that the circles are smaller because you can have iliac aneurysm as well. So you go from belly button, one, you measure. You go two centimeters up, you measure, tsk, you go two centimeters up and you try to measure. Now, when you go up, sooner or later you will come to the bowel, like in here, that is inhibiting. The trick of, with the bowel is that you try to massage it and you will activate the peristalsis and the bowel will go away, like in this case, hopefully, unless he has very resistant peristalsis. Okay, it's here. I think I have massaged it out. You see? The aorta almost at the renal level. This from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Measure. You would also do longitudinal. 
So now you cut the patient in long axis, a little bit to the right, and you see the aorta. You see how long it is? But there is one problem with measuring aorta in long axis because you don't know where in the lumen you are cutting it. Are you cutting it in maximum or in the fringes? So you never measure this, okay? You only measure transverse, okay? We will practice that. Okay, heart, the pump. Okay, you, you are already ready. So let's take the machine. Can switch take here. the, yeah. Okay. You know IVC? IVC you have heard? You, you, have you uh, practiced IVC? Vena no. cava inferior? Not yet. We'll okay. Today. Okay. So for aorta, for our, I'm here. So for aorta, you would cut across like a sausage. Okay? But for vena cava inferior, you would cut longitudinal. So you actually, you cut the patient like this, like for the hot dog bun, for the American one, you open and look from the side. As said, longitudinal aorta is useless, longitudinal vena cava is amazing. And how you do it most simply, this is trick from Frankfurt, you put the, take the probe, even cardiac or abdominal, you put in the median line, but very, very precisely. This is what you German tribe is very good in pedantness to be on the, media, on the linea alba. Very pedantically, you go up, 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 and a little bit, you turn as with the boat, you come on the xifuit. So the idea is med median line up where you see the heart. You see something beating? Yeah, and then either a little bit tilting to the right or if the xifuit allows one finger translation to the right, there is vena cava inferior. You see? And why we know this is vena cava inferior? Why we know it's not aorta? Not by pulsating, because you see this vena is also pulsating and it's moving. The definition is that as long as you are alive, vena cava inferior will have to flow into the right heart. You agree? And also, there are hepatic veins, I will show you in the hands-on, hepatic veins that flow into the vena cava inferior. Okay? This is definition. And then you stay there, and you let them breed, you let them breed, and then they make a deep breath, and it collapses, yeah? So this collapsibility with their breathing is feeling of how much the tank is full. If it's small to start with, collapses totally one or two ringers, okay? Preload. And the heart, you would, we would take the same probe, put it parasternal, where we would put EKG lead V2. It is called parasternal, long axis. Why? Because the heart is like this. You put it parasternally, and then you have to rotate toward right shoulder, because the axis of the heart, long axis of the heart is like this. With the very tall, thin people, it's more like this. But we very elderly and cardiomegaly people, it's like this. But you start with the probe, pointer towards right shoulder. Okay? And this is what you see. I just put it on. Beautiful, young heart. We see apex. Where is the apex? There, the base. You see mitral valve flapping. You see the left ventricle. 
you see the mitral valve almost touching the septum. See? Oops. Oh. Ah, some freeze. Okay. You see how it almost kissed the septum? This is very good surrogate marker for good ejection fraction. Because with the bad hearts, pump failure, those hearts typically also will be enlarged. And they will also only do the mit mitral valve will do like this. But his mitral valve does open up close because it can accommodate big ejection fraction. So big stroke volume. Okay? So this was parasternal lung where we have V2 of EKG marker towards right shoulder. And then in this same spot, 90 degrees towards left shoulder, you see the donut. You see the donut of the right heart, of the left heart, and you see the much smaller right heart. You see the septum that is very convex towards the right ventricle. Okay? And then in this position, we tilt the probe, tilt the probe from apex, you see there is no lumen, past the papillary muscle. You see papillary muscle, like a little ditzel inside, and then some more where you would open up, which valve is this? Hmm? Mitral? You heard of fish mouth? And then some more, I can actually see Uh-huh. Oh, what is that? What did I do? Oh, do well. Fuck. Ah, save me. You can actually see aortic valve, which is beautiful to see Mercedes sign. We'll see it live, but not so useful, to be honest. So this was parasternal short axis, good for pericardial effusion, Good, good for septum assessment and also in more advanced techniques of regional wall motion abnormalities. But don't worry about that. And in the same position here, we go down to apex. I can actually feel his ictus cordis, where the apex is touching the, uh, the thoracic valve, thoracic wall. And I tilt the probe. Yeah, maybe you go on the left side. Why we turn them on the left side? Why we turn them? Because it, the heart lays much better on the thoracic wall. Agree? And I put it, you see, the, I am exactly above the apex, up there, apex. Down comes septum, septum. On the right side of the screen, we have left ventricle. On the left side of the screen, we have right ventricle. Left ventricle is much more bullet-shaped, okay, conical. And right ventricle, as you see, is much more triangular. How you know which one is which? Well, you know by anatomy, but you also know by the fact that actually, okay, Allow me here. That actually the tricuspid, beautiful, the tricuspid valves, tricuspid valves are more, always more apical than the mitral valves. Okay? Because in massive pulmonary embolism, you will have bigger right heart. And you think, oh, what's the orientation? You'll be confused. Take this landmark. Okay? And as you see, his atria are, are much smaller than ventricles, half the size. This is appropriate. Okay? So left atrium, right atrium. Okay, so you've done subcostal. So plaques, which is probably single most useful and fairly easy to get. 
Paras tunnel is short, not so easy, but quite useful as well. Beautiful graphic apical four, but to be honest, in average patient, much harder to find, especially in COPD patient, obese patient. And vena cava inferior, of course, how much fluid to give. Okay, thank you very much. Now please send us to the workshops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregor, for your presentation and for your flexibility. We have a small present for you. Oh, it's thank you. Something quite regional. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh. So, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. And to all the participants, um, please proceed to your rooms and to your workshop rooms. Um, the work, uh, group number A will go to room E1, and the group number uh, group H will go to E2, please, right away. And are there any further questions to Mr. Prozen? Okay. Well, then, I hope you will enjoy your today's program. Have fun.